Okay, Kendra already uh, talked about the wonderful things we have here in Panama. Now I will talk about a lot of depressing things affecting our region. The dynamic is going to be very similar to the previous panel. I will introduce uh, the background paper uh, sessions regarding Latin America and the Caribbean. Again, very depressing. But our wonderful guests joining us today will tell us a lot about the responses given by different organizations to this problematic. Just a moment, please. We have a wonderful panel. We have about 35 years experience in the same panel. Here we have Maria Carolina Galindo. She's the executive director of Corporación Infancia y Desarrollo, CID. And she's joining us representing the AEOR help desk. She is going to be talking about the requests uh, they are getting and the responses they give. We also have uh, Deborah Greiser. She's a consultant, a researcher specialized in children and adolescents uh, living in human mobility in Brazil, especially unaccompanied and uh, separated children. And we have Sterlinda Vital joining us from Haiti. She's a specialist for children's rights and trainer of the magistrates school in Haiti with a lot of experience in the country and international experience. We will first present, then we will ask questions to our colleagues here. And finally, we will have a Q&A session. Of course, we are not going to share all the problems affecting children and adolescents in lack, neither all the solutions. The idea is for this to be a brief introduction, just a presentation of the different topics to be addressed in the next few days of this annual meeting. And if you have any questions or comments, or if you would like to continue discussing the same topics addressed here, please, approach us and we can continue the conversation. I'm Argentinian, so I really love to talk and debate and uh, fight people. So please feel free if you do not agree with me, no problem. Entonces, and if okay, so with this wonderful background paper that I drafted with a lot of help uh, from the Alliance uh, members, Hani, Camila, and a lot of people that appear here. What we did is that we summarized, of course. Well, I forgot to introduce myself, I'm sorry, but I will continue, okay? This is uh, arbitrary and uh, the problems affecting children and adolescents uh, creating child protection issues cannot be defined strictly by groups. But in order to just make the analysis a little bit easier, we divided on climate change and natural disasters, and number one and second, armed violence and gang violence, and third, forced displacement. Well, my name is Mara Gisela Luna. I am Argentinian. I live in the U.S. I'm an independent consultant uh, for several U.N. agencies, national organizations, international organizations uh, on child protection and gender violence. And just like before, feel free to approach me because I want to be able to cover everything now. We have 80 million statistics of 48,000 sources quoted in these background papers. So it's going to be difficult to, to be, uh, to give justice to all the information in these papers. So please let us know if you have any questions. Something important to mention about this region for those of you working in different regions is that the problems that we address in the background paper are linked and connected to structural causes and conditions in the region that I am about to describe. 
the first one is the great inequality in income and wealth in Latin America. We do not have a poor country, and the same is for the Caribbean. In fact, we are rich countries in terms of human and natural resources. However, there is an inequality in income and wealth, and this is huge. There is a measurement that I really like. It's depressing, but it's good to know it from IDB. And it uh, gauges how many generations is going to take a poor person in our country to get out of poverty. In Colombia, it's 11 generations. In my country, four generations. In Brazil, it's about eight generations. So what does that mean and why is that important to us? Because the children and adolescents that are being affected by humanitarian crisis are not, well, this is not the first humanitarian crisis. crisis. And sometimes uh, the only thing they know is poverty. They don't see a way out. When we talk about displaced people, it's not that they are running away from poverty. They are running away from the impossibility of running away from poverty. You know that. You know that this is real. The second main problem that we have here, and unfortunately we all share, is the patriarchal system and gender inequality. This is huge, and this is something that we can see in violence against the girls in violence against uh, women. And uh, the most extreme reflection of gender inequality and the patriarchal culture is uh, the feminicide. And uh, this is the continuation of gender violence uh, uh, that many children, women, and LGBTQ plus are exposed to. We know this uh, because of the work we do. And the third aspect I'd like to highlight is that due to the intersectional and colonial character of our stories, usually the inequalities that I just mentioned are affecting some cultures and ethnic groups more than others. For those of you that are not from this region, there are specific groups that are marginalized. Uh, first, I believe that there are about 422 uh, native groups and Afro-descendant groups. And the fact that, that some governments are not recognizing uh, Afro-descendant or indigenous groups does not mean that they do not exist. Many times they are being marginalized. And to that, we add uh, other ethnic uh, groups that you know from your countries, for example, uh, mestizos and people living with disabilities that many times uh, societies are not adapted for them to live a full life and LGBTQ plus people. So uh, this is the context uh, that we work in. And uh, the three problems uh, that I just mentioned, uh, you can read it in the uh, paper. First, violence. Uh, thanks to this paper and a lot of research, we know that uh, there is a worsening of the uh, safety and security situation in Latin America, especially for the influence of the Maras and the criminal organizations in armed groups. Many times, this uh, deterioration sometimes is handled with uh, by the government. So instead of creating social policies uh, for the youth to not feel uh, attracted to join any gangs or matters, well, we have uh, police officers, and this is the criminalization of poverty, as we call it. The second aspect is uh, the climate injustice. As it was well explained, this is a highly exposed region to natural disasters. In fact, this is the second most exposed region to the consequences of climate change and the environmental degradation by our own extractivists and uh, development uh, systems. We destroy the environment in order to develop our own economies. And this is the methodology that most of our governments implemented since we have existed. So for the last maybe 200 years, and now we are seeing the consequences of all these. And finally, we have forced displacement.
I will not give you statistics because you all know that 7.7 .7 million of Venezuelans uh, people, this is the highest displacement crisis in the world, and many of them need humanitarian assistance. However, I do want to mention that we do not have enough evidence especially for displacement crisis in Latin America, for example, the internal displacement crisis in general is concealed, is forgotten. Some countries do not have a real statistics or how many people are internally displaced, They're their own citizens. And what UNICEF uh, says uh, with ODI in 2023 and on the last LACRO research, on this year's displacement is that we need to have much more evidence on protection for those countries that are not Mexico and Colombia, where we have the most amount of evidence. We also need more evidence on the Caribbean routes. If you want to do the research and you want to uh, bring funds into that, we would appreciate it because yes, it is true, we do not have that much evidence. There are some other elements where we still need more evidence. We can talk about it later on. And now let's move to our wonderful panelists. They will explain a little bit more about the work they do. Maria Carolina, first. We'd like to know what type of requests or, or consultations you are receiving in the AOR Help Desk for Latin America in Spanish, and how are you responding to those requests? Good morning, everyone. Just like Mara stated, my name is Carolina Perdomo. I am part of uh, Infancia y Desarrollo. We are a local Colombian organization leading the Spanish help desk for Latin America for child protection. This table is part of the global responsibility area on child protection. We have an Arabic and French table. And for Latin America, we have the opportunity to have this table in Spanish. Now, I will quickly share about the help desk. Uh, this is an information an information point, or this is a help desk on how to manage the knowledge in order to provide responses to different concerns and technical needs uh, that organizations in Latin America have related to child protection. The minimum standards, the guidelines uh, for the sectorial work, also, uh, the toolkit that we use in the Alliance, for example, these are information sources, or this is the repository that we have, and you can uh, go into that repository depending on the situation and depending on the context as well. So that's what we do from the Spanish help desk. And what are the requests or consultations uh, that we get from organizations? Well, it varies uh, depending on the humanitarian structure and architecture in each one of the countries. So even though we have a technical information repository that's very important and rich, it also depends on the scope of each one of the countries. The thematics are related to updating the content, protocols, tools, different tools and actions that will allow for innovation in the practices from the different countries as far as their responses for child protection. Also related to the humanitarian aid structure, we have an example. We have received a recent request in Honduras, for example, there is a restructuring of the humanitarian structure. They are closing the clusters and becoming sectorial groups in order to potentiate the institutional capacity, the state capacity. And what do we do? Well, this is an experience that we've had in other countries, and this is uh, the first time recently that it's happening in Latin America. So what we do is that 
in a technical manner, we give them the documents uh, so Hondurans can continue the protocols and the route in order to carry out the actions. We also offer support and accompaniment based on the previous experiences and the lessons in different territories and different countries, so it can be tailored to the Honduras territory. This is an experience that we had a while ago in Ecuador. And Ecuador works in different sectorial groups. So we are offering the support and going through the process so they are not disconnected and uh, the actions carried out for child protection are not ignored. Those are some of the challenges uh, that organizations in Latin America face sometimes. Do you have challenges to answer to those matters? How do you respond? Good question. Well, there is a wealth of experience from global responsibility on child protection. As I said, we have a repository that is available for us to respond and provide answers to their needs. We want to be effective with our responses, but we face many more challenges. Number one, many of the documents are still just in English, so we need to bring it down to the characteristics that we have in lack. Sometimes, that is a little bit difficult. So what we have done in the different actions carried out is that we translate the documents, we give it some context based on the region, so we can bring it closer to the needs of those organizations. Uh, I believe that's one of the main challenges. Another challenge is uh, the staff turnover that limits uh, the actions and Sometimes we have to restart. We need to, y que ya se venían desarrollando. We need to uh, go back to the structures that existed. And we have another challenge. The visibility of emergencies in Latin America and the Caribbean. It is important to continue bringing everything to the table in a global context because this is limiting the funding for all organizations working in LAC. It is important to potentiate community organizations, local organizations, Considering the localization aspect, this is important. As agencies and international organizations, it is important to put the Latin America emergency in a global context, allowing us again to have funding resources for their needs. Thank you, Carolina. And for those of you who do not know, Carolina participated in a workshop about localization and you can find it in the Alliance YouTube. If you would like to get to know a little bit more in detail, so please go to the YouTube channel. Debra, we know thanks to the paper and evidence that Latin America is one, has one of uh, the largest crises on uh, children and adolescent migration. We have a we have 7.7 .7 million Venezuelans people in the region that had to leave the country. And a great amount of these people are children and adolescents. So if you could please tell us a little bit more about the situation in Brazil. Good morning. I would like to congratulate the panelists and all the participants in this event. Thank you for inviting me to participate in the plenary. Well, just like Mara mentioned, I am Brazilian. I work with child protection and I've been doing so for a few years, especially for migrant and refugees and children since 2015. Also worked with UN organizations like UNICEF, IOM, and I also worked in uh, civil society with uh, children's protection. 
I would like to share that in 2023, Brazil became, became the third country in Latin America with uh, the highest number of uh, migrant and refugees of Venezuelans. And uh, the study found in the Atlas developed by NEPO, uh, this is a research unit working uh, on demographics and uh, populations. We can identify uh, three migration waves uh, from Venezuelans. The first one, people that are, that are highly qualified that entered it through Barulio's port in Sao Paulo between 2013 and 2014. And they chose Brazil due to the restrictions imposed by other countries, uh, for example, the US and Spain. And for this group of people, Brazil was not always the first option. And many times, uh, Brazil is sometimes only a transit country. This happened between 2013 and 14. Since 2015, we have seen a greater influx of a Venezuelan migration. And this is the second wave. Uh, we are talking about people with better life conditions. We have a lot of teachers and engineers, but some of them uh, arrived by land by Coraima. Uh, this is a state in Brazil that borders uh, with Venezuela. And in this composition, uh, we noticed a lot of men, men accompanied by their families. And we also received indigenous people. On this uh, second wave, uh, we had a lot of people from Guarao and other groups uh, of indigenous people. And the other wave in Brazil started in 2018 when the situation in Venezuela was getting even more complex. So there is a migrant uh, movement with less financial means. Uh, we have uh, whole families, indigenous and non-indigenous and unaccompanied, separated and undocumented children. These uh, children started to get to Brazil after 2018. And with uh, these, uh, the Brazilian government and international organizations and CSO started a number of uh, responsibilities uh, due to the change of the profile of the group of people that were coming in. We started to receive the people. Since 2018 in Brazil, we have the host operation or the welcome operation. And uh, this is an operation from the federal government with the support from the Brazilian army and organizations, uh, international organizations like Doctors Without Borders, uh, the Red Cross, uh, UN organizations and the CSO working all together welcoming uh, migrants and Venezuelan refugees. The data is being updated constantly. Just like Mara said, we have more than 7 million migrants and refugees coming from Venezuela. We have about 510,000 migrants and Venezuelan refugees living in Brazil. From this number, 35 to 40 percent of them are children and adolescents. Therefore, we also have shelters uh, for the Venezuelan population. Nowadays, we have 8,000 people living in the federal government uh, shelters and UNHCR. We have 10 shelters to work with Venezuelans. If uh, you see the situation, you know that there are a lot of shelters uh, because of the rain situation or the flood situation in the south of Brazil. This is a recent uh, situation. Now, going back to the migration situation of uh, children, most of the children coming into Brazil come accompanied by their parents. Then we have uh, separated uh, children and unaccompanied children. We have statistics from UN, 
HCR, UNICEF, IOM, and the government. We have the ombudsman, and they interview children, usually crossing the border. Thank you, Deborah. I was going through what you were stating. Um, okay, Sir Linda, thank you very much for being here with us from Haiti. My question for you is, uh, you know, we get all of those extremely negative news from Haiti and the violence, the increased violence in Port-au-Prince. But we also know that Haitians are an extremely resilient, innovative people. And so the question is, could you please tell us more about the situation of security? And what are the responses that organizations are giving, like yourself, mm -hmm. when it comes to children associated with armed forces or gang, gangs, armed gangs, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the Alliance for having me. And please um, allow me to have a special thought for all children suffering around the world, and especially those in my country who are suffering and enduring plight because of RM gang violence. As you may know it, for the last decade, Haiti has been facing political instability and uh, gang armed violence. And uh, for more recently, uh, the threshold of armed violence has been skyrocketed. And uh, those gangs, they have grown in power because they have some complex ties in the field with political and economic elites, as well with the transnational organized crime groups in the Caribbean and Latin America. And children are paying the heavy price of those gang armed violence. And uh, the gangs are exercising territorial control. I will speak about the overall control. For example, in the capital, 80% of the capital is controlled by gang. But they are, they are also exercising a more exclusive control on their sanctuaries, what I would consider as enclaves, where state uh, cannot or not eager is not eager to penetrate so those children we don't have enough information about them and those gangs are also live streaming their activities their criminal wrongdoings as well as their uh, um their armed supplies to really exercise a sheer terror over the population so those children, the, the violations committed by gangs in the situation of armed violence in Haiti are similar to those which are being committed in situation of armed um, conflict because gangs are attacking uh, hospitals, school. They have set ablaze some schools, depriving children from education. They are attacking um, some, they are also denial, uh, deny humanitarian access. UNICEF uh, container has been loaded, depriving more than 50,000 uh, children from receiving critical aid, humanitarian aid. Uh, they have also abducted children, they are killing children, and they are also recruiting children. We have observed that there are a decreasing of children in the street. The former street children have been recruited by the gangs and we don't have access to those children. So the, the grip of the gangs over this territory is so strong and they are instilling their principles into those children and the recent report, uh, um, study made by UNICEF, which is yet to be published, has demonstrated that those children are looking up to those gangs. They are admiring those gangs because they are instilling, they are ingrained their principles into those children. So now, and we don't have national policies regarding the association of children with those gangs. We don't have a national narrative prohibiting the recruitment of children by gangs. And uh, we also uh, don't have a national referral program for the rehabilitation of those children. 
And oh now, how do we protect children in those situations, taking into account that we don't have the monitoring and reporting mechanism as we have it in situation of armed conflict? As you know it, after following the, the, the groundbreaking research of Grasso Machel in 1996, uh, from the resolution 1261 to the latest resolution of 2601, so the Security Council has put in place a monitoring and reporting mechanism which enable child protection specialists to uh, monitor, to gather accurate, reliable information, and we don't have that in situation of armed violence. So we don't have first-hand and disaggregated data on children associated or affected by armed violence. So I believe that as child protection specialists, we have to strive to develop a comprehensive, coherent mechanism that will enable us to really intervene for those children in a timely manner. So has action what we are trying to do at with, as we don't have any access to those children associated with armed groups. We have access to children formerly associated with armed groups which are currently detained in children facility um, detention center. So we are advocating, we are advocating with the national juvenile judges to see if they can expedite those cases. But I have to let you know that since 2018, the juvenile court has been dysfunctional because it is located in an excluded area. So we've been advocating with the president of the tribunal to have a new space for this tribunal to be functional. But still, the gangs have attacked about six tribunals, and some judges have fled the country, making it very difficult for the system to take into account those cases. And uh, we also working in the prevention. We have launched some campaign against the use of children um, by, by armed um, um, gangs, and we have reached about 25,000 people uh, so we are trying in this and we are also advocating with the national um, stakeholders to see if they can set new provisions uh, in the law, in the framework, because we have a national framework that has foreseen the use of children by, by armed forces. But even though that's those actions are thrown upon, but the law has not foreseen the sanctions. So even though Haiti has ratified the ILO Convention 138 and 182, but still there are some missing, there are lack of proper uh, um, national legal framework to really counter these uh, perpetrators. So this is globally what we are doing. Okay, thank you very much for sharing so much, so much detail on the context and your actions. If we still have time, we're going to do the Q&A. Camilla, we have 10 minutes to respond to any questions. Please, the microphones. The microphones are where? Somewhere. If anybody wants to ask a question, please raise your hand, and they will take the microphone to you. Good morning. Well, the question that I have for you is for Deborah. It's a pleasure letting me from UNICEF for Panama. And in the things that you were telling us about, I was finding a common point in regards to the care for children that are not accompanied, those who are by themselves without documents, those that have been separated. And by, part of the work that I do here in Panama is I have to be here in regards to what has to do with identification, registry, and care of these children. The case of these children that go through that in, I would like to know a little, which have been the challenges in regards to the care for these children that are not accompanied, separated in Brazil, are these children that are in transit, or these children that are only from Venezuela? Or have you identified other nationalities? And what has the experience been in regards to strengthening the systems of protection in the government? 
Please tell me about that. Thank you for that. Well, something that I have also learned with my investigation and the work that I have done with Organization of Civil Society and UN in protection of migrants, it's very important to work together. In Brazil, we have a work alongside with the government, UN, civil society, and something that is very important is the services. We also have the specialized services in Brazil. We have two services that are good practices of Brazil. I'm going to talk about one first that's called Sen Caste. Sen Caste is in Portuguese. I'm not sure how to say that, but Sen Caste, it's a service protection and care of children who are migrants, refugees, and children that have been victims. And this service started by the tribunal in Sao Paulo. They are specialists. This is for child trafficking. They have attorneys, psychologists, people from social services that do a joint work. And in Venezuela, it was called Palona, and everybody, all the children that qualify for these programs, the service started in Sao Paulo back in the year 2015 with what works in the tribunal, Paulo Farigas. He started this work. It started back in 2015 for children coming from Haiti because there was a child that was coming from Haiti and children that are not accompanied from Africa, like Angola. So this service is in Sao Paulo. First of all, because we have children that were coming from Guarulhos. And then after that in Horaima, which is close, we have a project of protection for children that are not accompanied, separated, non-documented from UNICEF with Absi Brazil. And there's a multi-professional group, attorneys, psychologists, people of social services, that gives support to the children from the time that they come into Brazil, the border where they have the police, the different agencies of UN and the Operation Acogida, that we have the identification with the children towards all the services, uh, migration, vaccination, and the child that is not accompanied and is very important also to talk to the different tribunal for children and to um, the council and also that the institution for childhood which is a host an area where we host these children so one of the things it's a shelter so we have this work in the with protection alongside with justice with international organization with civil society since you spoke about that ye one of the things that i would like to share with you is something that they spoke about this morning many times these children and adolescents that are in are vulnerable at the borders there are many they're scared of talking about what they feel what are their stories and one of the strategies that was used in brazil was drawings especially with the children indigenous children because many times they don't speak spanish and since they only speak their mother tongue it's important to have papers pencils that they can draw because many times that through a drawing we can find out what is happening with the child if they're suffering if they have depression and this is a very appropriate language not only talking because they're also very fearful when they go to interviews and they're by themselves. So the situation of the language of Portuguese is not so common and many of them do not speak. And the translation, the supporting team is very important in Brazil. The important is to do advocacy, to defend the children. It's very important independently, no matter their migratory status, where they're coming from, that all of them will have access to the law and also in the public policies emphasizing on this. So just to share with you another problem that we also have in other countries is information data. We have different data. So the sources help us to investigate. So we have data from UN, we have data from the government, we have investigative groups, and also sometimes we have problems with the age 
a cutoff based upon the age. So the international convention and another one up to 12, depending on the legislation up to the age of 12, some their children after 12, after eight, or sometimes they're considered adolescents. And sometimes they cut off at the age of 15. And this is the, the so having this idea for the adolescents that starting doing this work in ILO, then we start doing investigation. The numbers are always very complicated. So thank you for sharing your experience with me. Just a little comment, Brazil has protection, which is very important for those who are not from the region. It was the first one that had in 1994, and they have a law of protection called ECA. It's the leader of the things that have to do of how to apply it. We already know the gap between law and reality and so forth, but there's an institutionality, something that is different in each of the Latin American countries. So I just wanted to go ahead and add this. So it's very important, something about Brazil, is that we have the federal constitution from 1988 that already spoke about the integral protection of children. Then we have the International Convention for Children in 1999 after the National Convention. After this, we had the children and adolescents that have to do with this. So we have advanced in the legislation, the statutes, and many occasions, so many things happen with the children when they're at the border or when they need support from justice. So that's that. Well, I would really like to say thank you.